as we move into a time, a brief time of meditation, I just want to invite you to, to pay attention to how you're feeling in the space. And take a couple of deep breaths and shake out whatever may be feeling stuck physically. Feel your feet on the floor. And take a deep breath in. Hold and release. In, hold, and release. This movement, these changes of drawing in and holding and releasing over and over and over again is something that we do 12 to 20 times a minute, up to 30,000 times a day, generally without any conscious effort at all. Change is a real part of our physiology, of how we move in the world and how things work in the world. To give, to receive, to contract, to expand. Change is here to stay. So I invite you now to turn inward and contemplate the changes of which you are aware. <coughs> the changes in your personal life, things you may or may not have shared with anyone. The change is going on in the world right now. <coughs> and keep breathing. Just keep it breathing as we have a moment of silence. Many people don't realize that when you're a guest speaker, you're expected to submit your title and your blurb, what it is you're going to be talking about, sometimes weeks in advance. When I connected with Allison several weeks back to consider the possibilities for today's worship service, I realized I'd never been here before, we don't know each other, so I thought it would be a good opportunity to share a little bit about about my faith journey, my spiritual journey, and particularly the path I've been on most recently, which has taken me out of congregational ministry and into a community ministry of interfaith spiritual direction, working one-on-one -on -one and in small groups, as you mentioned, with, with people who want to set aside time to focus on creative ways, spiritual practices, things that can help them feel grounded and connected and good about their lives. That's something I'm very excited about. But in the time period since sending in my original thoughts on that, and the time that I needed to start preparing for today, things changed. All kinds of things changed. This week alone, 
the conversations around me have changed, turning largely toward the despair that caused two very public figures to end their lives this week, and toward the difficulty of talking about all of that without making it worse, without being insensitive to the complexities of what would lead to such an act and so many others are actively fighting for their lives. Without glossing over or sentimentalizing human suffering and the systems that perpetuate it. So public discourse changed this week. And then I got a phone call from a very old, dear friend. Letting me know that life as it is right now has become unbearable. And that he would like to just close his eyes and not open them again. He would like to just end it. And he called me to tell me that this was his goodbye call. So, celebrity suicides changed public discourse. But this phone call from an old friend changed me. So, although it's Father's Day, Although it's Father's Day, and it's the end of the church year, and it's a gorgeous day, and it's the picnic season, and there are lots of other things that we could be talking about, I spent this week realizing that as much as there are lots of interesting things to say about, about spiritual direction, and about spiritual courage, and a disruptive world, about how to creatively foster that balance in our lives, how to stay focused and fulfilled and hopeful, even as things within us and around us change. I realized that what this sermon title that I submitted weeks ago, what it means to me now, this week, is something much more basic than that. What it means to me now is, first and foremost, how and why to stay alive. So that's what I want to talk about today, with the caveat that I am not a psychologist. I'm not an expert on the issue. Uh, I know that it's very complex. What I'm sharing here is one deeply personal reflection that I hope will resonate with some of you and perhaps lend you some spiritual courage in this disruptive world. So it's only fair to start by admitting that as much as I have worked for societal changes in my personal and professional life, in my ministry, marching on behalf of gender equality and, and freedom in sexual expression and reproductive health, on behalf of Black Lives Matters and, and living wages and trees and wetlands and the worth and dignity of migrant families, the truth is I hate change. I have such a hard time with change, even when I'm the one who's participating in it. I'm not a fan of change when I'm not in control of it, and I am a creature of habit, and it embarrasses me to say that. I have learned to multitask. I have learned to rise to the occasion. I have learned to respond when, when things change, when schedules change, and there's a need, and you just have to adapt to it. I've learned how to do that when something unexpected happens. But what I've also learned is that there is a price to pay. There is a price to pay for that. Change wears me out. Disruption, generally speaking, shakes me to the core physically and emotionally and spiritually, especially, especially when the unexpected is as sustained and unpredictable as it has been since the 2016 presidential election season. It's been a roller coaster. Since moving to Silicon Valley, I've learned that that for many people, change for the sake of change is actually the goal. It's actually sacrosanct idea it is valuable and cherished. It is what is responsible for the fact that most of us probably have cell phones, and maybe some of us drive electric cars or, or have a special relationship with Siri. <laughs> disruptive mindset, which influences not only technology, but, 
but also music and art and bioengineering worlds over is inspiring a resurgence of civic engagement. I'm noticing groups intentionally gathering to imagine even more changes, even more alternatives to the status quo. More changes, more alternatives to capitalism, for example, or carbon spewing modes of transportation or rampant homelessness. They're looking to actually create changes. It is hard to book a room in my local library or community center these days because so many of my neighbors, people who very likely didn't even talk to each other before all of this, before 2016, they're now in cahoots together, working together to prevent some of the damage being done by the most recent changes and threats to our political and social and environmental systems. Every day, it's something new. They're doing this foremost by changing their own habits of solitary existence and of uninformed naivete. They're choosing to change that. They're checking their privilege at the door. And they're working together not only on behalf of damage control, but also to see what aspects of the past really do need to be torn up, really do need to be dismantled and changed, and also which ones, which ones might actually need to be reclaimed. Which parts of the past do we need to reclaim and restore? And I'm so heartened to see evidence of those changes recently. At the same time, I am personally aware of the toll that it takes to stay that awake, that connected, that collaborative, that creative, that hopeful, that engaged, that outraged. What a toll that takes when so much is at stake every single day, when every day brings change, brings news of change, of some other horror or threat, when parents don't know if their kids are going to come home from school alive, and children of migrant parents don't know if they're going to come home to an empty house or they're going to end up sleeping in a cage. And in the midst of all of that, in the midst of all of that, there's laundry to do. There are bills to pay, there are aches and pains to soothe, there are personal losses, deeply personal losses to grieve, and even holidays to celebrate. Normal stuff. So although I was really not wanting to talk about this today, and although I'm kind of scared to do this, I'm gonna get real here with you. I'm going to get real here with you and admit that last year I was so exhausted, so physically and emotionally and spiritually bereft for a number of reasons, only some of which have to do with what was on the news, that I also wanted, like my friend, earlier this week, to just end it. Just end it. Just close my eyes and not open them again. And the thing is, the thing is that practically everyone I know, once we get past the, the forced cheerfulness, the, oh, I'm fine, I'm, everything's good, once we get past that, they have privately told me that they have felt the same way at some point, at some moment, even for a moment, or maybe for a day, at some point in the last months or in the last years and a half or even longer, many of them, far too many of them, are still feeling that way. And you may know some folks who feel that way. Because political strife and, and depression, mental illness, addictions, economic stress, post-traumatic stress disorder, they find their way into every community and every family, and honestly, they always have. It's just always been a dirty little secret. More people than you might imagine, more highly functioning, educated, optimistic movers and shapers than you might imagine, more celebrities, more neighbors, more friends than you might imagine are suffering right now for any number of mostly invisible struggles. Some of them hereditary, 
some of them culturally inflicted. <clears throat> many, and this I think is really important to know, many of them exacerbated by the bidden and unbidden disruptions of this epoch in which we live, this time of social and environmental change. So, so many of us are finding very few compelling reasons to stay alive, to keep going, to keep our eyes open to say nothing of our hearts and minds and hands. It's hard to say it. It's hard to hear it, right? To love someone and to know that they suffer, knowing that there's no guarantee that anything we can say or do will ease their pain and make them want to stay alive or able to thrive. It's hard to see someone who seems to have it all give it up. It's hard to carry our own despair, and it's all so confusing. And some of us are really fighting for our own lives. And when deep down inside, we, we still hold on to this hope that there's got to be, there's got to be some reason to stay here. There's still beauty in the world. There's still potential in the world. There's still joy. There's still possibility. But those feelings of despair are all too real. And as Martin Luther King Jr. intimated in his speech of 55 years ago, some of those feelings of despair might actually be a sign of healthy, rational maladjustment to social ills. Maladjustment to old systems that really do need to change. Or maladjustment to changes that are just coming too fast and to recklessly oppose to that which spiritual teachings and science and human decency and tempered hubris recognize as life-giving and life-sustaining. Why are we fighting that? Why are we changing that? So my old friend Sean called me, a different Sean, I think. My old friend Sean called me earlier this week while I was out for a walk with the dogs, and I Oh, I struggled to listen to what he had to say, and I felt so helpless and so horrified at the extent of his loneliness and ashamed that I didn't know that because, because I had just assumed that he's doing okay. No news is good news. And truth be told, I was also a little angry at him, actually a lot angry at him for giving up, for not recognizing, for not honoring how much joy he had brought into the world how much creativity and playfulness and how his valuing of friendship and his valuing of, of art and beauty was so important to me and is exactly what's needed in the world right now. How could he not know that? How could he take that away from all of us? And now I would forever carry the burden of thinking that I had not been a good enough friend to him and that I hadn't let him know how much I valued those parts of him when I still had a chance to let him know. So I stood in the middle of the sidewalk and my two dogs were just pulling me towards some indiscernible scent that they found particularly interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I listened in stunned silence as cars went by to his sobs and to his wails and to his muffled words and in that moment my heart just broke open. My heart just broke open right there on the street. And when Sean had said everything that he had called to say to me, there was silence and I set all of my internal dialogue aside. And I responded, imagining his face in front of me, imagining that we were actually looking into each other's eyes. And I said, you're right, Sean. You're absolutely right. Things are so hard. Actually, I used a different word, but I don't want to use that up here. It's <laughs> all right. We're doing it. <laughs> and it doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon. And I know that you have had more than your share of struggles. I know that, and I know that what lies ahead for you doesn't look all that exciting or hopeful. And, and here's where I took a deep breath, and I said, um, 
I don't know why I never told you this. But I know what this kind of desperation feels like. I know how impossible it seems that something else, something good can grow out of all of this. I know because I was there, Sean. I was there so close. I know what that feels like. And somehow or other, I made it today. I'm not quite sure how, but I think it had something to do with you and the way that you live your life with such hopefulness and such creativity and such kindness and compassion for other people. That has changed me. That has made me want to be in this world. And things have changed since then, since that time when I felt that way. And maybe things aren't perfect and maybe they're not exactly the way that I would want them to be. But but they're more hopeful, at least enough to make me feel deep down that, that there is something to this life that we have, that there is something precious to life. It is worth it, even when it's messy. And I need you here with me. I need you with me. You are a part of me. This is someone I haven't seen in years. And I bit my cheek, and I felt like I'd said too much. Felt really vulnerable to say this until I heard him say, you have felt like this too? You know what this feels like? And especially, and you need me? You need me in this world? And suddenly, everything just melted away. You know, standing on the street corner, cars going by, dogs pulling me in different directions. It was only his voice and my heart. It was his heart and it was my heart. And actually, it wasn't even that. It was as if we shared a heart and it was as if we were inside a heart, a light-filled heart big enough to hold every single fear, every single shame and regret, every single embarrassment, every failure and shortcoming that ever was or will be. I can't explain it. But that's what it felt like. And in that moment, in that moment, I realized how my pride, how my desire to look like I got my act together, my desire to not intrude upon or worry, my friends. My desire to, to be professional, to, to keep my tears and frustrations to myself, revealing them only to my closest friends, or to reveal them only when they're fully resolved and nicely packaged. I realized how all of that had not only isolated me, not only isolated me in my own pain and added to it, but it had also dangerously reinforced in other people, including Sean, that ideal of cheerful, got my act together, don't worry about me, independence, promoted in this nation of rugged individuals more than anywhere else in the world. So no wonder so many people feel so alone and so desperate. The statistics truly are staggering. We are enculturated to wear masks. We are expected to have perfect lives, brilliant smiles, harmonious <coughs> families, exotic vacations, exciting jobs. We are expected to have resistance to age and gravity. We're expected to have endless optimism and pride and, and admiration for those who appear to have all that, plus a private jet. We just we want to be seen in the best light, right? And we want to see each other that way. It's only natural. So we show off our gadgets and we, we post selfies of fabulous meals and outfits and we track the number of likes we get as if they reflected our worth. As if they reflected fully the verity, the complexity of human identity and experience and potential. So one of the exciting, potentially good disruptions, societal changes that we've seen unfold 
these past years is the willingness, as I said before, of people to come together, to, to collaborate, to bring their best to each other, truly, to bring their wisdom and, and their strengths and their ideas, their resources, their gifts, contributing to and tapping into a hive mind pooling their knowledge and their skills. It is a good, revolutionary change that's happening. Another change, which I now think will prove to be equally pivotal, if it really catches on. Pivotal in strengthening our ability, and in, uh, individually and collectively, not only to stay alive, but also to help create a viable future for all of us, is an increased willingness of people to risk stepping forward and telling these kinds of stories. These stories of vulnerability that are not wrapped up in a pretty little package. Telling the stories of pain and of disguised loneliness and of shame and fear and of our needs, our blemishes and the very real effects of time and gravity, which I can testify to, the injustices, the marginalizations, the scars and wounds that people can no longer bear to carry in silence and will no longer tolerate for others. Not again. Never again. Please. A lot has changed this week. Among other things, I had a Me Too experience, an experience of, of taking off the mask, of putting down the armor, and of getting real, and then unexpectedly, miraculously, of bearing witness to the effect that that had on my, my old friend, Sean O'Hagan, who, by the way, has given me permission to talk about this, and in the spirit of honest vulnerability, he has asked me to use his real name. He sends his regards. He's still breathing. So that leap of faith with him made me realize that in addition to sacrificing time for all those resist meetings at the library and community center, all those petitions and marches, if we are to survive this epic of enormous change and threats of change, if we are to salvage the best of what this country claims to stand for and create something even better, more sustainable and just for future generations, we just may need to sacrifice our pride to the radical idea that our lives, in all of their messy and complicated imperfection, our lives exactly as they are honestly revealed are exactly what's most needed right now. And that's going to take compassion for ourselves and for each other, compassion for how hard this is. It's going to take spiritual courage. It's going to take a shared focus on the values that are worth living for. And a faith that we are not alone, even when we feel that way. As well as that. Faith that honesty about our struggles just may make all the difference to someone else, just may become a source of strength for someone else, enough to fill and hold and release their breath for another day, and another, and another. I realize we're running a little late, so I'm going to cut this short. In closing, I've come to recognize that it is as important not to underestimate what others may be struggling with. You can never tell what lies in someone's heart. As it is to not underestimate our own ability and need deep down to come out of isolation. To be honest, fully honest about who we really are. To take off the masks as your children have done with you by telling you who they really are. How important it is to share and to articulate and to make visible and useful all of who we are, all of who we are and who we have within us to be for one another. Not just put our joys and sorrows and successes on the table, but as much as possible our true naked vulnerabilities as well. So they at least have a fair shot of being acknowledged and potentially useful to someone else or maybe even transformed. I do believe that this that this is how we will end up healing ourselves and one another and transforming our world. 
That's the idea that I'm going to stay alive for. The sacrifice of pride is what's needed. So yes, it's time for spiritual courage. And the good news is that in covenanted community, you are well situated to help one another foster such courage. You are in an ideal situation, a web of relationship, where you can help each other choose not to give in to despair, where you can remind each other of, of those aspects of each other's characteristics and lives that give you strength and courage. We have to keep in mind, though, that it is still much safer for some to reveal their vulnerabilities than for others, because privilege is real, so we shouldn't be expecting everyone to just rip off the masks immediately. Related to this is the fact that as little as we can expect someone else to control when and how we enter or exit this world or take off our armor, we also can't interfere with another's freedom of choice, ultimately. We each have the freedom to our own feelings and our own actions. It's one of the big things we struggle with. In Unitarian Universalist community, ideally, hearts are held with great care. All hearts and minds are turned to those, those lessons of history and of history in the making of science and of accumulated spiritual wisdoms to the end that our hands can more readily reach out to one another and our masks can be set aside more safely, more effectively, more joyfully. I can see that you here surely are many wonderful things to each other, to your neighbors and to your families and to your friends. And I want to thank you so much for welcoming me here, me, a stranger, into this space this morning. One of the things that I pray you will consciously choose each day to be for one another, for everyone you encounter, is an ally on behalf of spiritually courageous leaps of faith. Share those stories with each other. Even if it feels hard, even if it's scary, even if you've got butterflies in your stomach like I do, share those stories with each other and celebrate them, especially when they have been made on behalf of those timeless, unchanging truths. You know which ones. Those timeless, unchanging truths that have, in every disruptive epic, helped define and refine and make joyful and beautiful and useful and holy the human journey in all of its complexity. So may it be. Thank mm -hmm. you.